I'm Joyce Hornady. You might say accuracy is my business. I make bullets. You are listening to the Hornady Podcast. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Hornady Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Swerzik, and I'm joined today, uh, a large group around the table here. This is probably the biggest podcast we've ever had, but we've got, uh, I think, the most brass around the table, if you were a military <laughs> guy. Uh, to my immediate right, for those listening, Vice President of the company, Jason Hornady. Jason, thanks for coming on. Uh, I know you're a busy guy. And then around the table, uh, we've got Joe Thielen, Assistant Director of Engineering. Across from him, Mitch Middlestead, Director of Engineering. And to my left, Director of Marketing, Neil Davies. So guys, with that long introduction, thanks for for coming on the show. Thanks, Seth. Sure. Happy to be here. And we're happy to be here with you, Seth Swerzik. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's, host. It's host. Host. Yeah. The host with the most. And I'm pretty excited about today's topic because uh, per usual, Hornady releases our new products every year at the NASGW show, which is in late October. So we're getting real close to new product season. And what I want to give our listeners is maybe a little sneak peek, a little little behind the curtain action of how a new product comes to be. Now, I don't mean the, the, the easy ones. I'm talking about the stuff that was maybe Black Ops or Skunk Works or maybe some stuff that got developed under the radar. And the next thing you know, they pitched it up to management as a finished product. Uh, because Jason, I'm, you're aware of it, at least on some level, some of that goes on around here. I don't know how well you know. Yeah. That. I don't know why you invited him. I know. <laughs> we don't I'm need aware. him to know these secrets. <laughs> I'm totally aware. But I feel like because of how we do things here and because of the management style uh, that you guys have, we really hit some home run products. And, uh, and as it turns out, a few of those home run products were started in the darkness, started in the fold. <laughs> you sneaky <laughs> bastards. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's why I've got to, you guys around the table because this goes back a, a long time and, and a lot of you guys had hands in just some amazing products that turned out to be, I mean, absolutely next level. Well, there's certainly always been, we're, we're all aware of the Black Ops stuff. I've participated in the Black Ops stuff. When, when things started to get really serious around here is when all of a sudden there was Black, Black Ops stuff going on that I didn't know about. But Why are you looking at me? Because then there wouldn't be of, then there wouldn't be black ops. Uh, Jason, no, right. I am not part of. I'm not the black part of the op. I'm <laughs> I'm the in. <laughs> but you know the the new products committee or team that we have. You know, most of the time we sit around and talk about what would be cool mm-hmm. or what you would like, or it, and so there's always somebody who's an advocate. Um, and a lot of times <laughs> sitting in that committee, somebody thinks something's cool. And the rest of us don't. And so then they just go build it anyway. And that's mm-hmm. when it really turns into a black op. And that's <laughs> happened a couple of times. Um, you know, but the first thing is, is somebody, it, it has to start somewhere. And you right. may as well give everybody the latitude and the ability to do that stuff. There's no reason to make it hard. This is fun. We sell fun. So yeah. um, that's a know, good way to put it. But some of them are incidental discoveries along the way. Like you're working on a bullet for... This type of project, not me, of course, smarter people than me, but then along the way and working with this product, oh, wow, if we add this component to this or do that, boy, that would really lend it itself well a- to a muzzleloader product or a this or a that. Mm-hmm. Sure. And so some of those things just kind of spurn their own uh, creation. Okay. Yeah. And I, f- I feel like from a new product development side, there are a few tiers of things and some of them are really low hanging fruit as far as making new products. Uh, you know, somebody comes out with a new cartridge, we should have a set of reloading dies. Okay. So you, you know, you, you make a set yeah. of reloading dies. That's pretty low hanging fruit. And then as it kind of tears down, um, we talked about this before we started recording. Sometimes manufacturers come to us with, Hey, here's yep. a problem set. Right. How would you guys handle that? And what are some instances where that's worked out? Yeah. Mitch has been in the game on a lot of those. Right. And so I think the best example of that is probably the 375 Ruger that we actually partnered with Ruger on that one. Um, And what they came to us with is they had that old Ruger 77 Magnum action and they were only chambering it in like 375 H&H and 416 Rigby. And through some of their processes and that was a very expensive rifle to make. Yeah. So they didn't want to make it anymore. So they came to us and said, hey, we want to get H&H performance from a standard length Magnum action. The same action that we chambered the 7 mag on, 300 wind mag. So they came to us with that. And uh, 
and that cartridge. And that was, that was actually a Steve Hornady idea on that one. I will throw props to him on the, on the head size, the same, the same 532 head, but with no belt on it. Yeah. Cause we all know all the firearm officiados know that on a shouldered cartridge, that belt serves no purpose. So we took the belt off, made the whole cartridge case 528 in diameter. And, uh, and then, of course, that's become the basis for both of the RCM cartridges, becomes the basis for the PRC cartridges. Yeah. You know, we've grown that whole family off of that cartridge that's now 15, 17 years old. Um, but that's how it started was they came to us with this particular problem they needed to solve, and we solved it. And that's a, that's a big one, too. So like 375 Ruger's got a limited market, although I think it's a phenomenal cartridge and have used it for many things that most people maybe wouldn't use a 375 uh, caliber d- uh, cartridge for. But, you know, that then spurned another development, spurned another development, and we had that cartridge case. And even in some of the things that weren't great big commercial successes, let's say, We learned something and then that technology was adapted and incorporated into something else that was a Grand Slam home run. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, But thankfully, you know, a big part is there's a whole bunch of people here that have been here a long time. So there's some institutional knowledge and and we remember that we tried this once and that worked really well. Maybe we can incorporate that feature into this new one. You know, so some of that plays into it too. Yeah. And that, that Ruger, that was a, such a paramount release because obviously it helped Ruger out a bunch and, and it's a great cartridge for what it is, the 375 and the 416. But then the children of the, that parent cartridge have n- been nothing but instrumental, I think, in our success, certainly as of yeah. recent here with the 300 PRC, 65 PRC, the RCMs. 65 PRC, it'll never take off. <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> Nobody. Oh, said no yeah. one ever. Yeah. yeah. Well, but that's an interesting story. But the other one that's similar to that, that's not the story I'm telling. Mm. Um, is the 308 Marlin. 308 yep. Marlin, they came and they were building the XLR rifle and they wanted a long range performance cartridge. And and we did it and it was successful until they sold the company to yeah. another operation that just wasn't going to work. But um, but the 308 Marlin then became the 30 TC, which then became the 65 Creedmoor. Uh, you know, and again, just those things yeah. that it developed into and the 65 Creedmoor is never going to be popular either. Never heard of it. Right. Mm-hmm. What? Yeah, <laughs> and it's it's funny that we're talking about six fives because I remember being in hunting camps and tables like this, usually with beer involved, where we talked about how come nobody likes six fives in the United States. Nobody shoots a six five. None of those are popular. Now, six five is on practically everything. So yeah, and the six five, much like the four fifty Bushmaster, and Mitch did the four fifty back in the day. It didn't start off like a race car, but it obviously turned into mm-hmm. a, a right. rocket ship. And the 450 Bushmaster kind of started that way too. And then all the states started using straight mm-hmm. wall cartridges in their muzzleloader seasons and bang, we are, you know, 450 off Bushmasters the off yep. the charts. Yeah. Yeah. Because you have to re- remember on the 450 Bushmaster, that was primarily introduced as an AR-15 yeah. Yeah. fit Thumper. cartridge. The Thumper. Yeah. It was, yeah. Yeah. It was called the Jeff uh, Cooper. Thumper. And now I, it's hard to even find a 450 Bushmaster in the AR platform. It's all bolt <laughs> That's action. True. Yeah. It's all bolt <laughs> actions. But it's really fun when you put it on a select fire lower. Yeah. 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 That's, <laughs> that's a handful. It's not that's that's a handful. handful. And not to say that we've done that, but maybe we have. Maybe. Function testing. Uh, yeah. Science. Function testing. Yeah, it's science. Um, One thing that I think was really cool uh, that I would like to hear from you guys that had hands in those projects, the 308 Marlin, the 375 Ruger, and... I can tie those to, and you guys can too, to cartridges and other products that we've released recently, is how fast the development process can go when you don't have a whole bunch of people Mm -hmm. muddling things up. When you keep uh, that group relatively small and you keep the the management style somewhat free, the quickness that you can go from concept to product is, it really blew my mind uh, as an employee. You know, I I came here, uh, did the technical service thing, had no product development uh, interaction at all and then so i had these preconceived ideas of what that looked like and then when i moved into engineering to work in ballistics and i had more of a direct hand in that to see how fast things can progress really really blew my mind what goes into how you do that let's say in a cartridge or a bullet and what kind of timeline is typically associated with something like that well it'd be a lot faster if our engineering department could move a little quicker but they (laughs) usually sit on that stuff for (laughs) 24, 48 hours or months or whichever. 
Joe's oh. got nothing. No, I was gonna. I was gonna be like, "There's been a lot of whole lot of, a whole lot of new products in the last few years for us sitting on our hands all the time." But yeah. um, market so market conditions play into that they, too. They, sure. That's what I was getting ready to go to because once we have concepts and drawing and all that, that's really the the fast part when we know where we want to go. And a lot of times it comes down to just getting the materials or the tooling mm-hmm. or the process time or the test equipment or whatever it is to test and evaluate or build your product. But if we already have some of that stuff in the works from previous projects, mm-hmm. we can mm-hmm. turn on stuff pretty quick. Yeah. Six arc fast. Six arc was yeah. six because arc we quick. had all the, the components yeah. there is a good example. But there's been numerous times that, that they've been held back because, Hey, that bullet is, or that press is running another bullet and we yeah. need that today. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think we've had four or five different, um, prototype or engineering uh, bullet presses, R and D presses, R&D yeah, presses. They all, they and as soon as they make something, that. it's like, well, don't take that off there. Just keep running it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And because so we, I wondered production. about that. Yeah, <laughs> this yeah. R and D press. Yeah, no longer, no yeah. longer production yeah. press now. Yeah, R and D is in air quotes. Yeah, R and D press. Well, and the, you bring up the six arc, and for those listeners that haven't, we have a, a six arc dedicated podcast. You have to go back back and check that out. But that is a prime example of quick turnaround. I mean, that mm-hmm. was. Uh, our senior ballistician working with a, a notable group within the uh, Department of Defense. And, you know, we've had that relationship for a while and we've established with that, that particular group that we're not just going to give you, you know, a square peg and a round hole and a big hammer and say, mm-hmm. here's our solution, go work. You know, we want to work with them and take their input and find a dynamic answer that, that answers that question, but I also answer several others. And yeah. once we've established that relationship, they said, here's our problem set. What would you do? And they trusted us enough to go to the drawing board, prepare something, and then give them a turnkey solution that solved many problems. And that, from what I remember of that development, that was, I mean, super quick. That was idea to test firing the first cartridges in about 30 days. Those guys aren't used to entities moving that quickly because they're government guys and it never happens. But we were down shooting it almost 30 days in yeah and that all came from us doing a shoot with those people on the 300 prc Mm -hmm. and again sitting around drinking beer later it was you know it'd be really cool if we could have one of these yeah they had a problem yeah they had a problem exactly and they trusted our people to give them a solution and i mean Jaden had a ready-made idea that wasn't too hard to do fit within their you know the the majority of the components in their platform so that it wasn't a wholesale change on and that's a whole other subject, maybe yeah. <laughs> maybe even another podcast, yeah. but like when you're dealing with gas guns and things that sometimes somebody creates the the mouse maybe and they, they don't figure out how to do the trap itself. I mean, it's like the whole thing is a component and everything has to work together. Sure. And sometimes, uh, you know, one thing is designed and cannot take advantage of anything else for ammo or bullets or whatnot, but that's, that's maybe another discussion. But sure. in this case, this worked with a minimal amount of change for them and yep. it was a fantastic cartridge commercially as well it's and huge it, and it fit in easy for us we yeah. had the the tooling and the setups and stuff we were already building a lot of that product in a different form so you we make could, the brass we could, you could make the, the brass ammo, exactly the bullets we could turn on it pretty quick yeah, it was so, easy yeah. to make barrels it was easy to make exactly. all this stuff all to, the barrels to do it all here yeah. yeah and that that was really cool that it was a military specific application and design first before it was adopted by sammy and now it's commercially incredibly successful and it's got to feel good to see that you know from the director and assistant director of engineering obviously you know your last name's on the building jace like how does that feel to see uh this is kind of tangential to our topic here but to see a group like that uh trust us to help them solve problems and then to be able to turn something over for them so quick that has been so instrumental well it was it was fun for starters yeah and and it was cool and that's the whole everything we're talking about um it's fun for us too. Yeah, there's been a uh, smile on my face since we started. Yeah, it's it's been fun to come up with something like critical defense. And again, critical defense is a bullet evolution. Mm-hmm. It started out as the bullets, the flex tip bullets started out in lever evolution okay. where we were solving a problem. Yep. And mm-hmm. we solved the problem and then started using that material in other places and and you had critical defense. Well, that will never work for a duty bullet. That'll never meet the FBI protocol. And it's like, well, why not? 
Why can't we build it? And mm-hmm. and, and Dave Emery didn't think that he could he get that. He didn't think didn't, he could get it. He, he, was, he, he proved right. himself wrong. Yep, he did prove himself wrong. And you got to love Dave. Dave. Dave would make these huge promises and off he'd go and then he'd come back and you're already down the road and working on stuff. Oh, I won't do that. Yeah. What? <laughs> ah! And the next day he'd come back in. Oh, it does yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're killing yeah. me, Dave. Yeah. And so from the engineering side, what is that? I mean, that's got to feel good for your team. I mean, you've got those employees uh, right. that work for you that are dedicated and passionate about this. And then to have the six art, for example, be such an out of the, out of the gate success. How does that feel like it's got to justify what you guys are doing and obviously prove that the process works? Yeah. But it's also, I mean, I think we've talked about this before on other podcasts. I think the reason a lot of that happens is not only that you mentioned the structure, the hierarchy, the structure of the company, but it also happens because all of us around this table and a lot of other people in this Mm -hmm. building are users of that product. They're going to go out and shoot it themselves or, you know what, I would use that for this application or whatever. And that, um, that just breeds success. If we're all right. genuinely excited in a meeting that's, about the potential gonna, for a product, I was going to go. It's going to go. It's well. going well. to go right. well. You exactly. Know, and that's when we're in consensus there. And the arc is an interesting one, and I assume we covered it in the podcast. But so we released it. We were going to release it in at the NRA show in April or whatever it was. Well, that was Cancel. 2020. COVID happened. Everything was just a, a nightmare. You know, obviously for the world. But we did have a, we did need to introduce it and we did need to get it out there. So we postponed it till June. Well, all the gun manufacturers at the time were making bread and butter stuff that was people wanted to Black buy new and firearms two, two, and they buying, yep, your standard configuration AR 15s. A new cartridge wasn't really part of the mix for mm-hmm. most of those folks because their back orders were crazy. So we released the cartridge. Here's this cool cartridge we've got. And, and, the, and the consumer responded enthusiastically. Not by buying, you know, off-the-shelf guns. There were a few manufacturers that were doing them, but by putting their own uppers together in order to be take advantage of this cartridge. So that was that was gratifying, obviously, for for all of us to see it just skyrocket and 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 in a non-conventional way. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I want to shift gears a little bit, and we can uh, pull Jason in here, I guess, from being the black part of the black ops to kind of being on the inside, and I want to. Uh, Get your guys' opinions on and, and recollections of products that that did kind of start as black ops and and, and like <laughs> in so much as mm, I don't nobody knows that we're working on this or they said yeah. they said maybe yeah, maybe I not know what they are too uh, but I feel like you probably had your hand in some of them or you were like <laughs> I'll play lead blocker for for Steve and and you guys go go work on that what are some of those examples and how did those products one come through the development process and then get brought to market. The first nervous one I remember is the 80 grain Amax. The 22 cal? The 22 for, yeah, singling yeah. out a bullet. Yeah. 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 Like that one just, <laughs> bing, it's, yeah. a video, it's there. We, nobody knew about it. And we, Joe and I had been to Camp Perry every year and it was just, it was something that was needed. We had the 75, but we needed an 80. So anyway. We just built one. Ended up with an 80 grain Amax. Joe and the crew made them and they ran a run and. Hey, we made this. <laughs> we need yeah. an item number. You but need thing, w- things were a little. We need an item number. Okay, when are you going to run them? Oh, we already did. Yeah, <laughs> we, we have a million hand. of them. That one was like beg for forgiveness, was, like oh, because th- people were going to buy those. So yeah, that was the and first that was a I great remember. bullet, not just for and, Camp Perry, but you guys should look at the uh, the gosh, what is it, the twenty two six millimeter mm-hmm. or the twenty two six Lonnie Yeah, mm-hmm. the twenty two six or the Texas Trophy Hunter, is it sometimes called like. That cartridge thrives on the 80 grain Amax back in those early days. <laughs> yeah. Some of them that I remember are some of the bullet projects that we would go mess around and make a few on the lathe mm. and then load them and send them with Neil to hunt with. <laughs> to South Africa. And some of them that we learned yeah. that don't work. Yeah. And then you get back and be like, well, that didn't work. Well, then cat's out of the bag. Then it's like, oh shit, now I'm in trouble. I got to <laughs> figure out what to do now. <laughs> so I remember some of those that were like, uh, yeah, we've kind of been working on that for a little while. I think the funniest one for me was the the radar. Oh, and that's oh, yeah. kind of a, that's how do you hide a hundred and ten thousand dollar Doppler radar? Dave and was it you and yes, it was Dave? me and Dave. It was me and Dave. And here they come in my office, and we were on a what we call Steve Cation, where Dad was out of the office in Africa or somewhere. And they're like, "If we're really going to make some progress on some of these things, we need two things." Okay, what's that? Well, we need a slow slow motion or super slow motion camera. 
and or high high, high speed, speed camera, high speed camera. Yeah. same thing. And we need a Doppler radar. And I'm like, well, how much are they? And they were both about a hundred thousand dollars. I said, well, Dad's out of town. You can have one. You pick. And they picked the radar first. They now have a slow or a high, high, high speed, speed camera mm-hmm. too. But uh, <laughs> he came back and he's like, why did we do that? And they said they needed it. <laughs> I don't remember how it went from there, but we just kind of <laughs> snuck it under the radar and and that piece of equipment has had a lot to do with some of our development. Yeah, instrumental. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. instrumental is the correct word because just in recent history, ELD Match, ELDX, and ATIP, I mean, from a, from a projectile design standpoint. Yeah, and CX too. Well, and CX, CX. Yeah. yeah, you'd cutting, have- Cutting edge. Yeah, you wouldn't have any of those four bullets with the design features that they have right. without right. that radar. And there were some others out there that made fun of us for that and told, it, told us it was just a big marketing ploy. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I we're, do remember that. We're well, laughing all the way to the shelf. Now it's interesting to see other people buying radars. Yeah. 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 Well, it's just a better, it's a better tool for the job. Right. That's all there is to it. Yep. Yeah. So, Fact. Yeah. Uh, another, the other black op, and we've covered that. Wasn't really so much a black op, but was was the 6.5 Creedmoor was a big one. Yeah. And we're going to get Dave Emery on the show in one of these seats. One day. Good grief. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Dave, if you're listening. You're, you're, you need uh, to get on the pencil podcast. Pencil us in here, yeah. uh, but uh, we'll get him on the show and we'll do a complete deep dive on nothing but the 6.5 Creedmoor. But I knew that would get brought up because having not you know been here for that, the stories I hear are that that did kind of fly under the radar that, and then people knew about it and then it was like, no, and then it was like, that one okay, was, we're doing it. <laughs> that one was completely under the radar. Like, okay. I mean, completely. Yeah. Like 6.5. 65-30 was the name of it, and we never head stamped anything that way. The other one is the 300 PRC way back in the day that we made cases that didn't have nothing on the head stamp and be like, I don't remember who got their hands on them. You, I don't remember who did, but like, what is this? There's that sounds n- like Steve. There's <laughs> yeah. nothing. There's <laughs> nothing on the head stamp. What is this? Oh, that's a cartridge. Um, been yeah. shooting that. Yeah. in some matches. Mm-hmm. <laughs> let's uh, let's let's. Yeah, that's right. Because that's it, yeah. right. Mm-hmm. Is, I remember that one. Sneaky Joe. I had. You have the very first gun that was ever chambered in that. Yeah, guns. Yeah, barrels. The thirty. It was like thirty three seventy five. Like nothing. So like it was. But you guys had made a thirty. 376 Steyr at one point in yeah. time, which was kind of, mm-hmm. that was kind of the that. precursor to the RCM at that point. Yeah. Well, and, and thinking w- about it now, you, you know, I guess the thing that kind of changed the, to black ops, if you will, for what we did for development, ordinarily, any of those cartridge development happened in conjunction with a, a gun manufacturer. Right. So like we, typically like it was, yes. yeah. you know, something with Ruger or something with Steyr. Smith & Wesson or Steyr or right. whomever else. That's typically how they took place and worked in conjunction with them. And then we kind of moved into the realm where we started to design things. And mm-hmm. we, I mean, it's not like we didn't have interaction with the gun companies. And, you know, there, were, there, was, there was conversation that happened and we gave, took, and, you know, back and right. forth. But now in the, like the 65 Creedmoor, we, we kind of bet on the come. We're going to, this is a cartridge. It's a, and right. uh, then obviously we got everybody else to chamber it didn't used to happen that way. Right. And I think on the 6.5 Creedmoor, you know, that started out slow and just built. And, you know, we just kept telling people, guys, this thing, this thing is a hunting machine. Mm-hmm. And nobody believed us. <clears throat> and so, oh, okay, well, we'd get another guy to build one. And then he just, he's like, man, I can shoot deer 400 yards. And uh, it just built. And we just kept telling people, you need to build this. You need to build this. And it grew. And what's a, that, what is a, your favorite saying about the 6.5 Creedmoor? Uh, it's the overnight success that took, took 10, 10 years. Yeah, there yeah. you go. And, uh, but uh, also I would like to say, then we had a shift in, we stopped part, well, we didn't stop partnering, but yeah, we started to come up with cartridges on our own mm-hmm. because I can remember when you guys first did, or when we did 6.5 PRC and 300 PRC, we came out with the 300 first and that's got a longer overall length. Mm-hmm. And we introduced it at the Sammy meeting. And the next week, I got calls from every head of engineering <laughs> for every rifle company saying, hey, guys, this isn't going to fit in my magazine. You guys got to make it sh- sh- order. And we're like, yeah. no, we no. don't. Yeah. We're not going to do that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so on the 300 and on six the 6.5, five, six five was that way. it's, you know, we're going to build the cartridge the way the cartridge needs to be built to perform the way it does. Yeah. And the gun guy's just going to have to find a way to do it. And you know what? 
same thing. So one of those one of those guys who called me on the 300 PRC called me back the next week. Oh yeah, we figured out how to do it. Mm-hmm. They had to take a spacer out or do yeah, try a little bit. bit. Yeah, try. yeah, it's good because we had already butt. we had already built guns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. in like, both those cartridges, yeah. so we knew that it was yeah. we knew that it was easily doable. And you designed it the right way. So there's there's a right way to do things, and this is the right way when it has to be this length mm-hmm. or or real close. And if we shorten it. What we're going to be doing is sacrificing performance somewhere right. else, and yeah, there's n- there's no reason to do that uh, with no, technology not, where it's at. at. Yeah, let's build the cartridge the way it's supposed to be, and that's what helps us make our cartridges such a success. Is I its almost, turnkey accuracy. I almost made a decision that would have been the death of the six five Creedmoor when it happened, and <laughs> the parent to the six five Creedmoor was the thirty TC, and mm-hmm. we'd been working with TC, and the guy who was running TC was a good friend. Here they come with the six five and. I'm like, guys, we're going to have to call it the 6.5 TC because that's what we had done historically with Ruger and other companies. And um, <laughs> you, you just thought I stole their kittens with the look on their face. <laughs> off they go. And then they sent Neil in later on. Come on, man. We can't, we, we got to call it something else. <laughs> and, and that's when finally it was like, okay, call it whatever you want. And I don't know if it'll work. And Thompson Center's going to be mad. And, and well, they sold the company, so it didn't matter. Didn't yeah. matter. And, and we probably sell more Creed more than Thompson Center did in its entirety at the time. But they were one of the first to chamber it. TC was. Yep. And then Ruger did as well. Yep. Uh, obviously, first out of the gate commercially was the uh, was DPMS at the time and an AR. Thank you, Dustin M. Holtz. Thank you, Randy Luth. And then uh, the Tub 2000 was the also. They, yeah, they would chamber yep. those. But it was kind of humble beginnings at first. And mm-hmm. then, boy, it took off. Everybody's starting to shoot precision rifle type shooting. Yep. Um, you know, and, the, well, and then, the the whole market, but in my opinion, from the outside looking in, was always looking for. Look, I just want to go. I don't have time for reloading to achieve accuracy. You know, I want to go buy ammo, and I want to buy my gun, and I want to shoot the two, and I want them to shoot well, and I want to be competitive or effective at hunting or whatever it was to get their system to shoot well. Mm-hmm. So I we, think that I think the whole market wanted that, and the Creedmoor del- was one of the first cartridges, in my opinion, that was mass produced that delivered that at distance or whatever you want to call it. And, and it would and it would run in an AR-10. That was another it thing. Would run in the AR-10. Like lest we forget, like oh four, the the Brady Bill sunsetted. So it was it was kind of the era of of AR oh, yeah. type things, rifles at things that were point blowing in time up for sure. And so that was a big part of it as well. True. Yeah, I just lost what I was going to say. Um, that, well, Ruger, when they did their precision rifle, yep. that had a lot to do with what happened with long range shooting as well, because all of a sudden a guy didn't have to buy a 3000 or yes. $4,000 rifle yeah. and optic. He could go buy something far more affordable and then he could buy ammo that was affordable. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and we didn't coordinate that with them. I, you know, the stars just aligned and it went yeah. well, swimmingly that's, well. It, it is a, a really great example because yeah, you have an affordable rifle that was modular enough to fit everybody with that chassis system that they had Mm -hmm. you know length of pole your comb everything was adjustable adjustable pretty decent trigger in that thing right out of the factory and then the ammo gosh you know at the time you could buy a box of six five creedmoor for 20 or 25 bucks Mm -hmm. and you had a legit chance at competing at a match i mean if you were the best trigger puller you could win with that combination and you know that's just exploded since then is the long range precision and i feel like that really precipitated the industry's, I'm going to call it trust in Hornady and Hornady design products. Because after the, the six, five Creedmoor, which took 10 years to become the overnight success, every cartridge since then, people trust that it's going to be accurate out of the box. You know, you're going to have forgivingly accurate or quote unquote inherent accuracy with the rifles. The ammo is going to be top shelf uh, and it's just going to work. And you know, the six, five and the 300 PRCs and the six arc are great examples of that. I right. can't believe you guys haven't brought up the ultimate black op that almost got him fired. Hmm. Was the 17 HMR? Oh, yeah, I was, Dave, I was yeah. saving that for the, the pinnacle of, <laughs> oh. of black ops, but I also don't know the whole story. I know that part of what you just said, but other than that, I don't know a whole lot. So to cue the listeners in, Dave Emery was our senior ballistic scientist from 1994 until 2017, I believe, and he had his hand in a lot of darn cool stuff, as mm-hmm. did uh, Mitch and Joe. Um but one project that he's really known for, the 17 HMR, yeah. our first rimfire cartridge. And yeah, if somebody knows the whole story, this is a good Black Ops project. Mitch worked here. I I did, but he it was so Black Ops, I didn't know about it. 
<laughs> it, it was because that's when Dave worked downstairs in the lab. ballistics lab, and it is and it is twenty feet underground. Yeah, and out of you, sight, out of mind. You can hide out down there all the time. And Dave, I don't even know where he got the cases from. I assume he got them from CCI. He, neck, he, yeah, he necked got them down. From, he bought he, them from there and necked yeah. them down. So he, got, Brad Olin. he got yep, empty. Brad, yeah, exactly. That's yep. right. So he got empty twenty two mag cases, and uh, he's down there. And I'd go down there, and I'm like, Dave, what are you working on? Oh, I just, I took the 22 mag, and I think he first nicked it down to 20, I believe. I probably, think that's right. Because the 204 Ruger and then came out like a year or two later. 204 was right there. Yeah, it was right there. Well, actually, actually the 204 Ruger came out after it. So, yeah, yeah, after yeah. it. Yeah. So, yeah, I think Dave. Because they were playing around with like the Vartar, because Derner was down there at the time too, mm-hmm. Doug Derner. Those little center And they part. both right. shot a lot of varmints back in the day. Right. Doug used to shoot prairie dogs all the time. Yep. So, yeah, I think Dave was just tinkering. And the story that I know is that, well, paraphrasing a lot of it but david was working on it and then your dad found out that he was doing that and mm-hmm. he's like we're not making a we're I, not making a rimfire cartridge and then there was like if you work on it anymore i'm gonna fire you so he's gonna fire him but he said if you can get it to go x velocity later after he calmed down <laughs> if you get it to go after, x velocity after he fired him yeah <laughs> well i think what happened was david gone up and pitched it to him and that he was like no we're not doing that and Dave just kept working, working on yeah, it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and that's what almost got him killed. But then then the facts proved themselves out and saved Dave's life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that was a big one. Yeah, that's crazy that, yeah, he worked on it, and it was so black ops that, yeah, yeah. the heads of yeah. engineering didn't know what was going on. And, and that cartridge has a lot to do with changing the face and shape of our company. Mm-hmm. Because all of a sudden, we had an every-person product. Um, you know, before that, we were... Just a little bullet company. And um, 17 HMR has a lot to do with changing that. And then the home runs started because then it was the 204, 204 and then it was, uh, you guys had the, the FTXs and Lever Evolution, Lever and Evolution Super Performance, and, they all rolled in together. I mean, and they just started stringing yeah. together and and it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. 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 RCMs. And they all, and we learned from each one. I mean, so. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. I mean, and not every one of them has worked. Absolutely. You know, the RCMs are not super popular and- Unfortunately, unfortunately, some of the ones that didn't work, it's because the company we worked with sold. Oh. Thompson Center sold. I, I joke all the time that if Greg Ritz was still running Thompson Center, the 30TC would be huge. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. they would have marketed it very well. Yeah. The Marlin cartridges are fantastic. Yeah, yes, exactly. they are. They're but what they are, yeah. Nobody's making a gun that they work in now because they sold Marlin to Remington at the time. But we're holding out hope that uh, their Ruger parent company will, will yes. bring them back, yeah, we hope. The, the 308 Chris, Mar- if you're listening, we yeah. need a 338 Marlin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the 308 Marlin and 338 Marlin are the best lever gun cartridges as yeah. far as a ballistic efficiency. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're, I mean, they're it. Yeah. Well, and then you, you pick up the cool factor of running a lever gun because there's just something, you know, cool yeah, about that. You feel like that. John Wayne. Yeah. I mean, who doesn't yeah. want to be like John Wayne? Yeah. And yeah, there's something that's uniquely Western about that rifle system. And then to not really have to sacrifice that much on the ballistic side of the house uh, is, I don't know, it's a win-win. And it you is. get the cool factor. And you get, you know, that 250, 350 yard performance that you don't typically get from a lever gun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. So kind of shifting gears here to the last and, and final gear, um, you know, the, the well, we, I guess I was going to mention uh, the radar. We already talked about the radar, but the radar really precipitated um, ELDX, ELD match, and ATIP and CX bullets where you really don't have any of those. And the cartridges that kind of came along with that all stemming from 375 Ruger. And we mentioned the RCMs, you know, the RCMs, like you said, Jason, not wildly popular right now. Thank God for the RCMs because we have the 6.5 PRC. Yeah. And so yeah, that's true, huh? to go yeah. back to what Neil had talked about, yeah, not everything was a huge success, but there was something that we learned that we carried on forward. And when you, uh, <laughs> You're able to do enough of those uh, and end up with a home run. Oh, sorry, the dog just grabbed the cord and uh, ripped it and <laughs> set off me. Moose is here with the, us. The thing about, so it started with ELDX, and we didn't even really necessarily know what we were trying to do when we started. I'd come back from a trip and had seen some people hunting longer range, which was starting to gain some momentum. And there's lots of, quite, we can have a whole other conversation about that, but they were using a competitive product or competitor's product. And it didn't go well. And I watched this elk go somewhere and then you start hearing more and more reports. And I came back and it was Joe. I said, okay, look, if people are going to take these shots, 
We're not saying how far you should take them. Mm-hmm. We have got to have a bullet that will reliably open up at a thousand yards. Yeah. And off he went. I didn't hear from him for well, a while. And was Steve, how does, I don't know how Steve feels that was a black about, op. That was, yeah, about mm-hmm. long range shooting or extended range hunting at all. Yeah. I mean, in our, we've talked about this on plenty of other podcasts. That's, that's a topic that. Yeah. It's kind of subjective for a lot of people, and if you yeah. can get closer, you should. Oh, absolutely. But if you meant, want a bullet that's going to work, it's not a Botel Hollow Point match bullet because they are unreliable. They'll yeah. they'll do they don't do the same thing every time. That's yeah. that's the big issue. They fly through the air just fine, but yep. upon contact with tissue, they're not designed to do anything except for yeah. fly through the air and punch paper and yeah. steel. So they can yaw. They can also pencil right through. They can break apart. It's Tumble. just not reliable. Yeah. Yeah. So you took you took the ELDX and ran with it and he didn't hear from you. He said, "Well, no. We, he, <laughs> I do remember that though. Jason's like, "Look, if people are going to do this, we need something that's going to work cuz yeah. people are going to do it. Let's let's make something mm-hmm. to help them out." I'm like, "Okay, so we can try." And then that's we worked on all that stuff. And there and there was a lot of conversation about should we be doing this because it, but but people will be taking those shots and whatever that is and your distance is your distance i i'm certainly far more comfortable under 300 yards than i am at five but i have been in situations where um i had something that needed an extra hole in it and there was Mm -hmm. a 500 or 600 yard shot and you know if if i would have had something different i I would have had a problem yeah Mm -hmm. and so make the best for the solution well then they went off on a whole tangent about tips and radar and but because of the radar, because of the radar, right. didn't know. I mean, yeah, and drag variability, right? Yeah, yeah. we yep. suspected stuff, but you can't, you don't know, you can't prove it until we had that radar. Because they had a, they had a, a, had a bullet. They had an, ex, you know, extended range capable hunting bullet, and then the radar came into play, and they started testing it, and they were seeing this. Well, that's I guess the, anomaly. I don't know on the on the on the. We had to we had to pull it. You remember yeah, that? We, you guys were ready we, to put we, it in the we catalog. Could, we were ready to go, and we're that was a nerve. I mean, it. that's probably my most nervous day ever. Like, I forgot all about that. Uh, I'm sure glad we Jason, did. Though. We, yeah, I'm no kidding. So glad we. But we did. We walked down there and said, "Jason, we, we can't, we can't go with this." And he's like, "Are you kidding me? Yeah, it is we, end it, of August or whatever. Time. It's go time." Yeah. Wow, I didn't. didn't I wasn't yeah. aware of that. I forgot all about that. Yeah. So that, but I mean, that's just how it goes, and like part of the thing that. I mean, we're, we're pretty organized in how we do these launches and we do have a good schedule. Um, like right now we have many other, I mean, coming in a week after this podcast, you'll see a lot of our new products, but we have other new products that are waiting to be done, but the market isn't quite ready for them. Uh, maybe we're not quite ready for the actual production of them. Um, so there's lots of things that, that come into play when, when we do launch something new and, and. Timing is is everything usually, but the fun ones are the ones, and not just from us, from from other f- friends of ours in the industry. When they unveil something, you're like, I didn't know I needed that, but man, I, I, I need know, that. I Holy want cow, that that's one. a good one. And that's what's fun yeah. for us is when we can be the catalyst for some of that emotion yeah. in people out there. Mm-hmm. Yep, that is that is true. It is fun to be a part of that. And again, it I think it all comes back to the upper management and then the direct engineering management that they just let. The people that design the products go to work. That is an incredibly admirable trait to have because when you've got employees, one, that you can trust, and two, that are passionate end users, you yeah. can just turn them loose. Well, and, and we have pockets of, of people who are the advocates for certain product lines and certain, yeah. I mean, the one that we're launching in a week or two, whatever it is, and so I can't say the name of it, but you were a big part of that. Jaden was a big part of that. They weren't going to let it die. The nope. six arc Jaden wasn't going to let die, mm-hmm. you know, the muzzle loading products, Ryan Damon has kind of taken that one, but you guys, you know, Preston and wasn't going to let well, that and, die. And, well, FBI critical duty was yours. Yeah. Guys, yeah. we are, you were the main guys. We're going to have, I want this. Yeah, we're, right. we are going to build a bullet to, to satisfy this type of. And contract. I know you're like your dad, he, he, if somebody's convicted, that's meaningful to him. Yeah. Yes. If somebody's convicted and they can, they're really behind something and they push it and they can argue it emotionally and intelligently, then he's apt to listen to them. He really hasn't told us no on a new product in a long time. The only time he's really told us no is 
you don't have the ability to make that. Today. Yes, yes, oh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Which yeah. voice of reason? You sometimes know? you need the voice of reason. Damn to, fact. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> you can sell a whole bunch of stuff, but it doesn't do you any good if you don't ship it. Yep, that's the truth. Oh, see, you just got caught by the dog. I got too. caught. Yeah, mm-hmm. when we were doing the introductions around the table, I forgot to mention that Moose, uh, the yeah, chocolate, lab chocolate lab, is uh, down, down beneath here. the table here, pulling on our cords, <laughs> and he's got a tennis ball. He he's a handsome guy. No, he's on screen. That's yeah. his only feature. Is he's good looking. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, he spreads morale. He's a morale yeah. booster. He's a retriever, not yes, a giver. Yeah. He'll, he'll, he'll <laughs> retrieve and never <laughs> give it back. Yeah, okay. yeah. you know. <laughs> so before we wrap this up. You know, from a new product standpoint and a development kind of black ops, skunk works kind of thing. Is there anything uh, that each of you want to let the listener know um, about who we are, or what we do, or how we do it? Uh, we can go around the table with final thoughts if you'd like. Well, that's kind of a mean question. I, you know, the 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 whole thing is, and and you've said upper management a whole lot. I don't see us as having an upper management. I just see us as having our group of people mm-hmm. and anybody that wants to start a project around here even if it's guy on the plant floor if he's convicted and has an idea yep oh, have at it guys let's go if it's cool mm-hmm. and again there's some stuff we have a guy who does little tool parts and i will tell you sometimes it's hard for me to get excited about the change to a cartridge gauge or something like that but he comes in so excited that you why wouldn't you let him run with that i mean okay we might only sell 12 but you know what? That's 12 more than we sold last year. So <laughs> That's a good that's, way to put it, though. Yeah. And that's a, a unique perspective, I guess, that I didn't look through with that lens, that as the upper management, you see us as just a team trying to make better yeah. products. Yeah. That's pretty cool. What about you guys on the engineering side? Any last closing statements? Well, I was just going to say, and this is something we've brought up and you've brought up with the folks who are end users of this. And that's something... Joe and I really focus on when we bring somebody new into our department is that they, they have to shoot and yeah. generally have to reload or at least be exposed to reloading, uh, have to have that above average knowledge of firearms. Uh, that's almost a prerequisite for working for us because we just, that's the kind of people we want to hire. That's the spirit we want to cultivate. Because yeah, if you're going to, you know, and I, and I even make this thing when I came out of college I uh, also interviewed at another big manufacturer in Grand Island that makes farm machinery. I'm not a farmer. Mm. I don't care about a combine or a tractor. But I was a shooter. I was a reloader. I was a hunter my whole life. So it's fit, and that's what we look for. We, we, we then really look for that fit in our department. Um, and then the second thing, yeah, we can – we, we – we can do what we want. We've got that flexibility. I mean, really, when it comes down to it, the longest thing it, it takes in the development is getting a chamber reamer. It's the only <laughs> thing we can't make. We have barrel blanks for almost every we single to, caliber no, no. and twist on hand. So if somebody gets an idea, you can put it on CAD. Where are you order storing reamer. all that stuff? I didn't know anything about that. Uh, yeah, we got, I don't know, we probably got 100 <laughs> barrel blanks, don't uh-huh. we? We got, whole, a, lot of, we got a lot of barrel, barrel blanks. blanks. Black and, op. <laughs> and so to, you know, hit you up for another piece of equipment, Jace, if we could make our own reamers, then we wouldn't even have to wait that two or three weeks to get a reamer. Well, how much are they? Grinder. $100,000. $100,000, <laughs> $100, <laughs> yeah. That's the magic yeah. number. That's the number. Yeah. 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 Steve's out of town. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell? Yeah, well, that's, I mean, that's truly the only thing holding us back. And we've got, um, you know, we got a couple good reamer manufacturers we work with who turn stuff around quickly for us. Uh, we thank them for that. We've got a good relationship with a bunch of different manufacturers of the barrel blanks so we can have those quickly. Um, so it really is just getting that chamber reamer drawn up and we can do anything. We've got the whole cartridge case side. Joe and I have both grew up on the cartridge case side, yep. so we know what we can and can't do there. Um, most of our guys doing their cartridge design have worked at Hornady a while, have worked in the different areas, know what's capable on the cartridge manufacturing side, know it's capable on the firearm side to make sure firearms guys can do it. Um, got an excellent team in the ballistics lab, knows what powders to pick. Um, I mean, we've got everybody there. We've got specialists in every area and we can turn it around quick. And, and we should shout out to our powder vendors too, who have worked with us Absolutely. on oh right. boy. lots of different projects. That's a whole nother, well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just yeah, that's a whole nother podcast. The last yeah. couple of years, you know, with the COVID thing, I was going to mention this when, uh, Mitch had mentioned that we have a lot of barrels on hand and with that COVID thing, barrels went from a six to eight week yes, lead time to a six to eight yeah. month lead time. Yeah. So we're going to get barrels in so that we're not waiting 
you know, and that was justifiable. And then on the propellant side of things, that's been another, yeah. So yeah, like you had mentioned, big shout out to those guys for working with us and being able to, to help us with and, and make special products for us too. That's been instrumental. And, and a responsive, uh, gun making industry as well. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we've couldn't do it without those guys. We have a bunch of friends that, that are willing to listen to us and, and help us with what we're doing and we get to help them by hopefully getting new SKUs out there for them and different calibers and, and chamberings and offerings and things like that. So that's a huge one. Yeah. And that's precisely why we will never make guns right yeah. there. Right there. Cause I mean, they, they help us move the needle and they're a big part of what we do. I mean, for me personally, like we, we just have a great culture here. Mm. Um, it's a bunch of <laughs> good dudes, Seth. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's a bunch of good dudes and gals. But, um, yeah, it's just, there's a bunch of great people here that are, it's not lip service. We love to do what we do. We go to rifle matches. We listen to what people tell us at rifle matches. Um, we listen to our other colleagues and friends in the industry about trends and things that are interesting. And then we come back here and work well together and come up with fantastic ideas. And like I said, if we're in a meeting and everybody's eyes kind of open up a little bit and we're all kind of excited about a project, it's probably going to happen. Then it's just a matter of making sure that we can fit it into our production schedule and our marketing cycle and, you know, things like that. But yeah, it's a lot of fun here. Got to, we're blessed. I mean, if 18 year old me could look at not 18 year old me, uh, he'd go, <laughs> wow, that's pretty cool. You get to do what you do. So that, that's a big part of it. And that's what, in my opinion, it's our culture that drives a lot of what we do. Yep. That's, Nobody dreads yep. going to work. No, no, that's yeah. a good point at, uh, yeah, Mitch had mentioned it, and then you kind of yeah hit that point again that we've by who we've employed, this team has grown and has created a culture of we were all hunters, shooters. We all care about what we're doing. We're firearms guys. We're gun guys. We like to build guns, shoot guns, go hunting. And back to Jason's point at the beginning, it's fun. Uh, it's just a fun place to be, and it's always fun to design new stuff. So, guys, thanks for for sharing all that with us. Hopefully. The listeners uh, picked something up from there about kind of what we do and how we do it. And uh, at least appreciate, if nothing else, that we like building cool stuff. We're always innovating. Um, we're a small team, but we're a passionate team. And, and that's hopefully what shows through with our products. Yeah, fun. Yeah. Thank you, Seth. Thanks, yeah. Seth. Yes, yep. you guys are welcome. Everybody out there in podcast land, hopefully you enjoyed this look behind the curtain of some of our product development. Uh, we appreciate it. If you like this. Uh, let us know about it. Drop a comment, like, subscribe. If you got questions or if you want to hear something else, email us at podcast at hornady.com and we'll catch you on the next one.